Good evening and good night to everyone listening at whatever time you're listening. I'm Joe Anthony Myrick, short for Jam. Behind me is Eminem, short for M. And you're listening to the Mental Health Check In Podcast, a podcast dedicated to spreading mental health awareness as a means to help all of us heal. That includes you, dear listener. You are not your past, you are not your mistakes, you deserve healing. And hopefully this podcast opens your eyes to that fact. It's all a part of the healing process, so let's all just heal together. And the perfect healing component to this episode is none other than my guest today, Sarah Benincasa. She's a writer, comedian, actress, mental health public speaker, a teacher, an author, and more recently, a podcast host. She's the voice of a relatively new podcast called, well... This is a normal, where she provides relaxation techniques while also just trying to make sense out of this not normal that we're living in for the time being. And she does a lot of that in this episode, as far as trying to make sense out of the senselessness that can be found in this world. She spends a lot of the episode giving advice on tough situations, on coping, recovery, on healing, really, and all made for really eye-opening, tremendous conversation I just can't wait to share with you today. But first, if this is your first time hearing about Sarah Benincasa and you finish this episode thinking to yourself, wow, I want to see more of her. I want to hear more from her. Then you can check her out on social media at Sarah Benincasa on Twitter and at Sarah J Benincasa on Instagram. Instagram where you can also follow her accounts for at well this isn't normal and at excellent coats on irritated women which if you ever wanted to see photos of excellent coats worn by irritated women let me tell you you've you've come to the right place or you're you're going to the right place i should say the go go to that page follow it you found the right place you get exactly what you came for and she even has a patreon that you can directly support for as little as a dollar a month. It's patreon.com slash Sarah Benincasa. And of course, her podcast, Well, This Is a Normal, can be heard on places like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbay, iHeartRadio, and pretty much everywhere podcasts can be heard, much like this podcast, the Mental Health Check-In Podcast, which can be heard on all of your favorite DSPs, including, but not limited to, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Anchor, Breaker, and even YouTube, where you get the full visual of Lord Marshall of Mathers behind me. And if you want the full story on why Lord Marshall of Mathers is behind me, you can hop on over to UpliftYourDiet.com where you can hear a plethora of other podcasts under the podcast network, including this one. And, of course, an article regarding Eminem and Lord Byron and the picture behind me by Miranda Adama, which is a fantastic read. I might be biased in saying that, but from what I hear from other people, very fantastic read. Definitely check that out. And you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, at CheckinPod, at CheckinPodcast, MentalHealthCheckinPod at gmail.com in case you want to email us any questions, comments, concerns, apostrophes, catastrophes, and other novelties. But for now, at least for this episode, let's just dive right into this. And I feel like the perfect place to start is just, you know, with everything not being normal, as your podcast says, how are you dealing in, I guess, living in this normal? Like, how are you feeling at this moment, emotionally, physically, spiritually? Today, I'm feeling good, but a bit off because I had trouble. I had trouble sleeping for weeks and then basically just slept all weekend. Like, I didn't go without sleep for weeks. But um it's been, you know, it's been an interesting time period. It's been a strange time period. So it's raining really hard. Uh, if if listeners hear that in the background, <laughs> you'll, that's what's happening. Think of it as soothing. But um, to respond to your question, it, you know, I've been, I'm feeling pretty good. Today was a weird day, but um, some days are weird days and that's okay. Like I'm still healthy and, uh, you know, 
I get to work. I get to take an hour out of my time to talk to you. I get to go back to work. I get to rest. I get to eat. I get to move. So I have a lot to be grateful for. Well, I'm glad to hear that very much. And like in you talking about, I'm kind of reminded and we don't have to get into this if you are not comfortable talking about, but I know you're a recovering agoraphobe. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. So with knowing that, like with the whole quarantine thing, has that been triggering at all for you? Well, I, my first book is called Agora Fabulous Dispatches from My Bedroom. And that was about my experience with agoraphobia from ages 17 to 30. Um, well, really childhood to, to age 30. Um, but, you know, over time, things have changed. So while I still experience agoraphobia, I wouldn't say that this has triggered that actually. If anything, it's, it's, <laughs> I've gotten my fill of being at home by myself. Um, you know, I've been in recovery from, that's one way to term it, being in recovery from um, agoraphobia. I never say that I'm cured. I say that I manage it. So it's been many years since I've been on medication and had talk therapy to deal with it. And you know, a host of other techniques and things. And it changes over time. I think everyone's recipe for their health does change over time. But it, you know, it, it, it's very strange because early on in the pandemic, I had to ask myself, am I avoiding going outside because I'm concerned about this illness or am I avoiding going outside because old habits are creeping in? And the answer was always that I was avoiding going outside for the right reasons because we were being told in Los Angeles to stay indoors as much as possible, to not gather in public, to not go into stores, things like that. So I do think that having had a background as somebody with agoraphobia in some ways is helpful because I, I know how to set up a day where you're just at home and to still get things done and to be in the rhythm of that. But I, I would say that like everybody else, I certainly got to the point where I was tired of just being home all the time and certainly tired of being by myself. And that's one reason I came back to New Jersey. I'm renting a place in Jersey so that I can see my family more easily for a few months. How's that working out? Just being with your family more often? Being with my family more often is good. I definitely try to balance it. I try to, I see them once or twice a week, but, and sometimes it's been more, but when it was more, I realized I couldn't overdo it. I still really like my alone time, my separate time. I need to have privacy. Um, I am inherently a bit of an introvert. So that's how I replenish. I think I am a highly sensitive person um, reading. I think Dr. Elaine Aaron is her name, reading her literature about highly sensitive people has been very helpful to me. I just, you know, I need breaks. I need time to recharge. And so that's why I'm really glad I'm not actually living with my family. That was important to me. And I think in future, when I come back, if I'm back for more than a few days, I think I'm going to try to get an Airbnb. I just think it's better. Like it just seems to, it, you know, having your own space, if you can afford it is a good thing. Yeah. I think having your own space is really helpful and just condensing your own thoughts, staying with your thoughts and just makes it more accessible to, I guess, uh, mold your own space in a way that's comfortable for you. A happy space is a happy space in your head, I think, if that makes sense. Absolutely. The way I even like right now, my place is a little disorganized right now and I'm not super organized, but I know that I'm going to feel better this week, probably tomorrow when I get time and, and motivation to do some cleaning up. Like this weekend, I slept so much because I just, just got exhausted. Um, and today was kind of a recovery day from that. And so I think I'm hoping that tomorrow I have more energy and can do these things. And I, you know, even when I don't have much energy, I still do a little bit every day to tidy the place up. And that really, really helps. Does that work as like self-care for you? Oh yeah. I think that tidying up definitely helps us self-care. I think that when it doesn't go to the extreme, when it doesn't, doesn't go to the extreme of being obsessive about it or taking a fear of a lack of control in the world and just visiting that upon one's home and having to have everything neat as a pin. Like that's not healthy. But I do think that, yeah, 
yeah, tidying up. Sometimes things like putting on face cream, which, you know, touching your face, touching it when it's, when you can, um, when it's okay, like just doing a dry scrub on your body. That's, that's, that's not the deep, that's not the deep self-care that you hear about coming out of act activist communities, particularly coming out of black women, progressive activist communities, that concept of self-care runs a lot deeper. And in a lot of ways it's been co-opted to like sell face cream. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is um, sometimes doing these small acts that uh, are unnecessary. It's not necessary generally to put face cream on, you'll survive. But if it feels good to you, or if it feels good to put makeup on, or if it feels good to soak your feet in Epsom salt. If that feels good, these are small acts that can provide moments of rest that I think are really important for people. I may need to try that. Like I've heard good things about like the face creams and stuff like that, but I've never actually tried it. But like, I've, I always heard like the phys how it feels good, like physically, but I never thought how it shapes like you mentally in a positive way. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think it can be a meditative act, a calming act, a quiet act. And when, when it becomes a habit, a sort of ritual that you do every day to indicate to yourself, okay, now it's time for a break or now it's time to rest. It, it's like when I sit down on my couch um, and I put a pillow on my lap, my cat runs right over because she knows that means it's time for her to sit and um, get cuddles. So she wants that all the time. <laughs> um, and I can't do it all the time, but I do it a lot. And so when you, you sort of have that Pavlovian response to it, and that happens within us as well. Like when I, like right now I lit um, a couple tea lights and I lit just a Yankee candle because that's my signal that let's see what time is it right now. It is uh, 5 15 PM East on a weekday. And so when I light the candles, the lights are down. My friend, I have a friend who lives in Stockholm who does the same thing. The sun sets at like 3.30 right now. So she lights candles because it creates this warm coziness and it, it's an indication, okay, it's time to slow down. And even if you've got several hours before bedtime, it kind of reminds me, okay, Sarah, you've got leftover cold brew coffee. You're not drinking that because then you won't sleep at night. How about a cup of, of herbal tea instead? Or just these little indicators that we can put into the day to either get us motivated or to get us to slow down. I think that's, that can be really helpful. Yeah. I think stuff like that is very helpful as far as like the ritualistic property to it, because I think that like coming to a ritual like that, it's kind of like saying small goals for yourself. Like you feel good. It feels like an accomplishment, no matter how small the goal is, it feels like an accomplishment, especially in these days where you can only do so much if you commit to like a small goal and you, achieve it day after day as a day as like a ritual and I think that goes a long way as far as just just boosting your self-esteem and your mental health I think absolutely I think it, it I th that's a great point and I think that it it can build your confidence in your ability to do other things so if you're having trouble getting out of bed in the morning well but you feel kind of okay by nightfall you can build in some little rituals in the nightfall to prepare yourself and as you continue to do them night after night that'll build your confidence and your ability to get up and you could even sometimes when I'm having a really hard time at night I'll write myself little notes to see in the morning or I'll set up something that I know will bring me joy in the morning I'll be I won't want to get up and then I'll think oh but you've got like you made overnight oats or you've got that toast that you really love just waiting to be made or you've you've set out your clothing things like that make me go okay that's a little bit better i can remove another element of something that would have given me pause or made it too intense for me absolutely and i kind of want to backtrack a little bit because i mentioned your agoraphobia and that kind of i have follow-up question but we kind of like trailed off into these other interesting aspects of the conversation i kind of just left it dangling in the air so backtracking a little bit I asked that because I was just kind of curious like I guess when you encounter when you do encounter triggering situations whether it be related to your agoraphobia or not how do you deal with those situations how do you deal with triggers if you don't mind my asking well that's a good question well I don't mind it at all um well, for, I'm still getting to know what they are. In some cases, I know that if I don't sleep enough, I do know that that is very likely to trigger um, depression or a panic attack. 
So I know that when it comes to um, things that might trigger some anxiety in me, anxiety in me, there are certain modes of transportation. So I, I know that um, certain people, I know that. And so I try to plan ahead more and I practice meditation every day. You can't plan ahead for everything. And as soon as you plan ahead all you want, everything gets changed. But if I can put myself in situations that tend to bring me joy or peace or both, or are at bare minimum neutral, for example, if I know that I have to go to the airport, I know that I would like to have a flight when there's not going to be a ton of people in the airport. So that might mean an extra early flight for me. And that's okay. I also know that if I haven't been able to sleep the night before because I was excited that having a bunch of caffeine at 4 a.m. as I'm on the way, it's probably not a good idea. So I'll have water, I'll have something with a little sugar and a little natural sugar in it, like a banana. I'll have some almonds. Once I get to the airport, if I feel like, okay, I'm, I feel good, I'm going to have an espresso or something, then that's fine. But I know that traditionally I have a lot of anticipatory anxiety. So if I can lower that by not adding really intense stimulants, like a sugary smoothie, um, you know, I'm not going to grab a Jamba juice that has a lot of sugar in it. <laughs> uh, that's not actually healthy, healthful. It can be a fun treat, but it's not actually good for you. And some of those smoothies have as much or more than a couple candy bars. So I'm going to resist that. I'm going to say, okay, I'll have a banana. Maybe I'll have some berries. Like I'm still going to get a kick from that. I'm going to get some protein. I'm going to drink some water. And I then once I'm feeling more alert, awake, my body's waking up with a little bit of assistance from this fuel that I'm putting in it. Then I can go, okay, this, this caffeine in a small amount is going to help me. It's going to help me focus a bit, feel more alert in a good way. Cause I don't want to get to a place where I'm so uh, I'm hyper vigilant. Um, I'm also not going to eat a ton right when I wake up, because I know from past experience that that could give me a stomach ache. And then I might be embarrassed or feel sick or feel nauseous or feel gross. And that's going to create more anxiety. So just kind of going slow. If I need to get to the airport early and I end up hanging out for a few hours, I will have researched in advance if there's an airport lounge that I could buy a day pass to and how much is it? And if I can afford that, I'll do that because I'm more likely to have a little corner to myself. And sometimes they have like, nice scented things. Sometimes they also have like free food. <laughs> so um, when I can planning ahead, I mean, you can't plan ahead for everything, but trying to set up your day in such a fashion that there actually is some rest. I'm just putting my, my phone on do not disturb, by the way. Um, but uh, so that there's actually some rest built into your day and a, like a tiny bit of luxury even that's very, very helpful. Um, if I have to see somebody, if I know that I have to see somebody with whom I have a history that I find to be uncomfortable, um, I, you know, I talk to my therapist about that and kind of figure out a, a plan in advance that, that works for me personally, preparing for ways in which I can respond to that individual or not respond as the case may be. Um, and just spend as little time with them as possible. And if I've spent a lot of time with them, take a lot of breaks. I think that's really interesting right there. And I guess that's something I never really covered on here before. Like if you if you do run into somebody who you're uncomfortable with, I'm sorry, I'm kind of like, I've got the wheels going in my head a little bit. That's okay. That's good. Like if you've got, if you run into somebody that you're uncomfortable with, or at the very least was uncomfortable with, like, let's say some years passed before you two broke off for whatever reason, like, do you like, do you engage with that person or do you just go in the opposite direction? If I don't have to engage with them, if it's not absolutely required for me to engage with them, I'll just ignore them or go in the opposite direction. I'll leave the situation. If it's a situation I really enjoy and them being there is not going to detract from me enjoying the situation, I'll stay. But if I don't have to engage with them, there's there's no reason. There's no reason to be fake polite. Um, if it would make me feel better and build my confidence to show myself, hey, you can do this then sure, I'll say hello. But that's only if that's for my benefit. If 
if it doesn't feel good being around them and I truly have no purpose to engage, there's no point. I'd agree with that. Yeah, like if you're uncomfortable with someone and or they at least made you uncomfortable in the past, then engaging could trigger some things and just make you uncomfortable all over again. So it's yeah, best and also, to... like who wants to deal with them? Even if family, in family situations, if they engage with me, oh, sure, I'll say hi. And then I'll get out of that situation as soon as possible. I bet I don't want to deal with you. Um, if, if, they, if, if we lock eyes, I might instinctively wave hello um, just because that's instinct. I'm trained to do that, right? But there's no need to pretend that that I love them or that I want to spend time with them. You gotta, my opinion is that you need to take care of yourself first. You don't need to be rude, but you don't need to give away your energy because you have finite energy in every day. Every human being has a finite amount of energy, even the people who seem to be constantly productive. And I know that sometimes in my life, I've seemed like one of those people um, and other times, definitely not. But I, I have lots of friends who seem like they're always doing something. They're always busy, 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 but they have to rest. Even they have a finite amount of energy. And if they don't take time to rest, and I speak from personal experience, we burn out. So why would you, unless it was absolutely necessary, why would you waste time in a pointless chit chat conversation or rehashing old stuff that's never going to get fixed, never going to change, change with, with like a, a cousin who hurt you <laughs> or an aunt who was nasty to you or uh, a grandma who constantly criticizes your weight and makes you feel terrible. Like what's, what's the point of that? You're not obligated. You can be kind. You can be polite. If God forbid they need your help, if they're ill, whatever. Sure. Um, if you're the only person who can mow the lawn or if you have, you know, if, if, if you can afford their electricity bill and it's the difference between that and them being in the cold and winter and freezing, of course, like I'm not saying be cold hearted or, but you also get to detach with love as, as they say in certain recovery programs, det detaching with love and in certain books, I think in, uh, I think in the book codependent, no more Melody Beatty might use that term. I don't remember where I first heard it, but detaching with love doesn't mean um, oh, I'll pray for her. That like passive aggressive smiling thing where they just hate you. That's not it. Detaching with love is really love for yourself. It's saying, I, that person is nasty. They are rude. They are mean. Or that person just thrives off of pity. They always manipulate me so that they can get something out of me and they never offer to help me with anything. I love myself enough to detach respectfully and to not engage. Like you don't have to answer every phone call, answer every text, answer every email. You can be busy. Uh, and, and yeah, you might have to deal with some fallout from people who disapprove. But if your life gets better when you detach from somebody, it's a good sign you shouldn't be involved with that person unless they are legally dependent on you for some reason in which case of course you have to meet your ob obligations but otherwise like life's too short there are plenty of people who would in my opinion deeply value the kindness and generosity of others and you would get something back in return even if it's a smile and a thank you that really warms your heart so you know i think there's a difference between being selfless and letting a vampire drain your blood <laughs> your emotional blood so to speak yeah i think that's a really good way of putting that and like i think the whole detachment thing you were talking about is a great analogy for it because i feel like i've said this myself a few times in these last few episodes uh energy is sacred like you have to protect your energy and if protecting your energy means detaching from someone no matter how you felt about that person or they felt about you vice versa however it is protecting your energy protecting your space also protects your mindset and in doing so you'll you'll feel better you'll feel better just detaching as soon as you can rather than try and just sit in this uncomfortable feeling just telling yourself oh it's gonna get better we can work through this or i just need a break from this person that th there's like a 50 50 chance that can work so if leaving if just detaching completely protects your space and that may be the best option yeah absolutely that's okay and it also helps to you know to go into therapy if possible um 
if you can access it, if you can go, if, if cost is an issue, which it is for many, many people, um, asking for if, if the provider offers a sliding scale or going through a lower cost um, online provider like Talkspace. I've never used them. I've heard good things, but I, I can't like officially endorse them or anything. Also, they'd have to pay me to do that. But um, uh, there are others as well. So really taking care of yourself first, that cliche of putting your own oxygen mask on first is absolutely, absolutely correct. And you may find that you are better able to work on your own stuff when you're not constantly distracting yourself with trying to run and do this for this person, run and do that for that person, fix this person, provide counsel to this person. A lot of times people who are codependent, people who are uh, really get sort of supply, get energy off of taking care of others, being indispensable, quote unquote, to somebody else. A lot of times when we do that, what we're actually doing is avoiding looking at our own problems, our own addictions, our own failings, our own flaws, the ways in which we have chosen things in our life that don't make us happy, the ways in which things have chosen us, things have been done to us. So I'm not saying that, that it's all, that we are all perpetrator or all victim slash survivor, whatever it may be, but being obsessed with other people's lives and inserting yourself constantly and always being at the ready and always volunteering. A lot of times that is avoiding dealing with whatever's really going on inside us, whatever's really happening for us. For me, uh, daily meditation helps with that. And so does, um, I'm sober. So my sobriety group helps with that. Um, di people, different, different people to find different ways into that. Uh, but it, that, that can be really helpful because it's uncomfortable having to look at your own stuff. But if you do it with a supportive community that um, is not taking away from you financially and it's not draining you emotionally, but if you, if it's, a, you know, perhaps group therapy, a 12 step group, something like that, you, you may really find that you feel supported. It creates a container where we can actually work on our stuff and not feel so scared because we don't have to be alone. And we can still do for others. We just have to do for ourselves and also take care of ourselves and improve ourselves. Absolutely. And I'll definitely co-sign that because like, that's something I also had an issue with myself. Like I would try so hard to just, I guess, like insert myself in other people's lives by helping them or I'll do them a solid or just taking on different projects and situations onto my life and I soon realized I was just doing that because I didn't want to deal with my own issues I was dealing with. If I'm helping someone with their issues and, oh, I have this good feeling inside. And then I am i don't have to think about the tougher things in my life as much. But at the same time, for if you're, well, me, if I'm constantly inserting myself in other people's lives, then that's mentally draining on me. And it goes back to what we were saying, how energy is finite, energy is sacred. I... I really need to really pick and choose where I can put my energy in because otherwise I'm just adding stress, adding mental drainage to my block and someone else is getting the benefit who may or may not appreciate it. So you really need to, I guess, pick and choose your battles if that makes sense. That totally does because if you have a friend and I've been this friend, who's always complaining about the same situation, maybe with different characters, maybe every experience at their job is the same. Everybody's always against them at their job or, or it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, gender neutral, loved person, their, their spouse, it's always the same, no matter what spouse it is, no matter who they're dating or with their kids, it's always the same. Every child is always the same with the problem. Blah, blah, blah. Well, it's something about your friend that your friend is doing something they're choosing this relationship over and over again and eventually you can get tired of giving them that pity i've been that friend and i've been the friend who just gets tired of listening to it so a better thing to do and it actually keeps enabling them to stay that way if you're just constantly the listening ear and the kind one who's helping because they'll never hit the point where they go oh shit, this is untenable i can't sustain this so a better thing to do is to set a boundary there or just to quietly back off and let them do their thing because 
you might have something to deal with. I might have something to deal with. And, and it's so easy to ignore it. I mean, I used to, I used to in my dating life a lot would just date in order to like not be by myself, which is I think rude to the other person. And it's, it's not nice to yourself either. Now, that said, I got to be with some people who I genuinely loved and cared about, but also there were a lot of people I was just filling time with. And that feels like crap to the other person and it doesn't feel good to you either. And in the end, I think a lot of times what we're doing in friendships and relationships is trying to fix something that happened when we were little, trying to fix the parent who was or was not there. Sometimes the parent who is not there makes a bigger impact than the parent who was there or vice versa. And in that way, it's sort of, we're trying to like retcon the experience. We're trying to change the past. We're trying to change our origin story. And you can't do that as a human being. You can't. So it's, it's tough. I mean, and, and I should say also, like, I do believe in therapy very strongly, but there are different forms of therapy. It's not just sitting on a couch or laying on a couch, talking to somebody about your feelings. There are forms of therapy where you get homework. There are forms that are very spiritually informed, some that are entirely, um, looking at a biological basis, some that, I mean, it's amazing. I had a therapist once who wrote me a prescription for exercise. It was very cool because she knew that that would be something I could put up and that I would look at and it would, it would, you know, encourage me to do it. Like I needed that almost like a permission slip or an assignment. Um, so, and, and you do get a lemon sometimes just like car shopping. So it's okay to take them for a test drive too. I absolutely agree with that. And you said something really profound there. Well, you said a lot of profound things, but one thing I really zeroed in on was when you were talking about just dating people to fill time for yourself. And I kind of related to that a little bit. Like there were times where I didn't even really want a partner in my life, but I felt like I just need to fill a void. And mm -hmm. it, a lot of times it would backfire on me. And it's it's very much, it goes back to what you're saying about protecting your energy as far as just energy is sacred and you have to be, my voice is going out. <clears throat> one second, one second. Sure, no worries. I'll, I'll get some water too. Yeah, with Dane, there were times where I didn't even necessarily want a partner. I just wanted to fill a space and that would always backfire. And that goes back to stuff I would do as far as just trying to make other people's lives feel better by piling situations on top of me and doing favors for people and helping them and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess you know, like when to summarize everything you were talking about, like the difficult part is figuring out when it's helpful and when it's not so helpful because there are instances where I am glad that I kind of tried so hard to fill a space because it opened up whether it be job opportunities, friendship opportunities, it allowed me to meet people who I'm still friends with to this day or having a relationship with to this day. And there are a lot of benefits from it. But when the benefits are so good, you kind of see past the the stuff that's kind of weighing on you, if you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's cool that you do this podcast so that you can talk to people, many of whom I'm sure are strangers to you, and you can find these places to relate and because that means the audience can listen and sure some people won't won't feel that episode but other people will yeah i never thought of it like that i like to kind of think of this as like a step one to therapy whether therapy mm -hmm. be talking on the couch or group therapy or however you want to whoever the audience wants to consult therapy in the form of whatever type of therapy they want i hope this is kind of like a step one for people to think oh I know what they're talking about. I need to, I should probably work through these feelings in my own way too. So hopefully it, hopefully it helps people in that way. I highly recommend going into a therapeutic relationship with, and it can be your rabbi, it can be your minister, if they are trained in, in pastoral counseling. That I think is important. If, because some of them don't get that don't get that training training. But if you're imam, if you're if you're rabbi, if you're minister, your priest, whomever it may be, your faith leader, um, if they have training in counseling, if when they were at divinity school or they were in training, they actually did a course or maybe even minored in college, some of them um, minored in school in it, they did a PhD in it, whatever it is. But so they have real experience. Some of them have also worked as social workers and also understand you may love your faith leader. You may love them as a faith leader, 
but they may not be the one for you when it comes to counseling. So keep that in mind too, because whether it's a secular therapist, and I've gone always to secular therapists, it's a secular therapist or it's a religious counselor, none of them has all the answers. None of them is the representative of God on earth. None of them is representative of the higher power on earth. None of them has the direct line to genius, to the cure, you know, the, the goal of a healthy therapeutic relationship is to work together. And this goes, I'll say this, this also goes for a, a medical doctor. If you're seeing a psychiatrist, if you've experienced psychotic episodes, manic episodes, deep depressive episodes, things that, that don't just respond to, um, to talk therapy, to prayer, to meditation, to, um, to nutrition changes, to uh, exercise. And all those five things I just mentioned are incredibly helpful, incredibly helpful. And for some people, they alleviate symptoms of anxiety, depression, but there's certain things like exercising, eating right, that's not going to cure your bipolar. That's not going to eliminate and now may it lessen the might it lessen the frequency of manic episodes or deep depressive episodes maybe i don't know i don't know i haven't read anything about that i've i've only read about it with regard to panic attacks and um, old fashioned depression unipolar depression not that bipolar is new fashioned it's always i think all been around we just have different names for it now but there are certain things i would never tell somebody who's experiencing schizophrenia or somebody who uh, has a borderline personality disorder. I would never say, you know what? If you just took sugar out of your diet, if you just did Atkins, if you just exercised, if you just went to a yoga retreat, no, those might those things help you overall? Perhaps, perhaps, I don't know, everybody's different. But when you see a psychiatrist, look at it as you are co-creating a relationship with this medical professional, do they have superior knowledge to you with biology, with brain chemistry, with all kinds of things? Yes. But do you have a voice? Do you get to speak up about what you're experiencing? If you're experiencing side effects from medication that feel intolerable, if you're experiencing a medical emergency, do you get to talk about that? Of course. Do you also get to say, okay, doctor, I will try this meth. I will try this course of therapy. Uh, let's say you get prescribed an atypical antipsychotic, which which you may that may happen if you let's say have schizophrenia. So let's say or or um, I think certain type of bipolar sometimes they prescribe. It. So whatever it is, let's say you get you get prescribed that, and you take it, and it's awesome, uh, and you're doing really well on it, and then your doctor says, um, maybe we should try something else, like you should speak up and you should say. Well, why, doctor? Why, why do you think so? Because I'm having a pretty good experience on this. Why do you say that? And get into the conversation. Of course, if you're taking something and it's really not working for you and you've given it the amount of time, because th these things take time to kick in. You've given it the amount of time you're supposed to, like let's say two months, and you're like, this sucks. You should be able to talk with your doctor and come up with an alternative plan. You, I don't, you know, you shouldn't have to feel desperate, like, oh no, this is the only way. Well, there are lots of ways. There are lots of different approaches. And the hard thing though, is that I can say this, but for some people, especially people living in rural areas, they may only have one psychiatrist in their area who they can see or their health care, you know, the, their health insurance, or if they're on state insurance or on Medicaid, whatever it is, Medicare, they may only be able to see certain people. So that's where it becomes difficult and where I can't, I can't be too like pie in the sky about it and be like, yeah, just find the provider who works for you. Like that's a privilege in this country to be able to find the provider who works for you means you have a lot of, of money um, to do out of pocket searching. However, you may find that even within your health insurance plan or within your state system, your local system, even at your county health care center, if you're going to the county center for public health, they may have more than one psych, psychiatrist. They may have more than, they probably have more than one social worker. So if it's possible, you know, do try and get a little taste of, <laughs> of what's out there. Cause you may find you really gel well with one person and, and that's the right person for you. That was a long ass discussion of that. Do you have Marshall Mathers behind you? Like who is oh, that? Is yes, that a that, saint? That, that is, that's Eminem dressed as Lord Byron. It's, I, I actually just started a digital. <laughs> saint Marshall of Mathers. It's Lord Byron. Wait, I love this. It's beautiful. 
Thank you. It's it's for my website. I just started like a digital media platform and the first article on the website breaks down the comparisons between Eminem and Lord Byron. And I got this local artist, Caitlin Noel, to cook this up for me as like the cover art. So that is yeah. so cool. Will you send it to me so I can put it in my feature in my newsletter? The Will you send article the, or, the article? The, yeah. OK, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. So that would be I. I do a weekly newsletter called serotonin through, uh, <laughs> through my, um, Patreon. And, um, I would love to include that in this week's. All right. Thank you. I really appreciate that by the way. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. And I'm also glad you really broke down like how like therapy works, different types of therapy, when you need therapy, what types of therapy you may need in certain situations. I think that's a really important distinction to break down. I'm glad you did so beautifully. And just to backtrack a little bit one more time to everything we were talking about as far as like detaching and just just to put a bow on that, like I've learned that it's good to just have like a pros and cons sheet, like when you're taking on so many things at once and you see there's more benefits or like there's a lot of benefits and you kind of ignore the the cons of it all, you should write down like a pros and cons sheet. It's a small thing, but I feel like I've been trying to get in the habit of doing a pros and cons sheet before I go into any situation. And if there's more cons, then that kind of tells you that it's not for you. And if you just really break down your life in pros and cons, and you see a lot more cons and pros, then there's some adjustments I think you need to make in your life. That's that's just a, a suggestion on my behalf. Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh Oh, um, there's a uh, thunder and lightning storm, which you might hear, or the blisters might hear. We made it more interesting. I think actually a transformer might have just exploded, <laughs> but I still have power. We're still recording, so it's fine. This is a very interesting time of year. I'm in New Jersey, and um, we had a tornado watch today, <laughs> which was very interesting for uh, for a lot of the state. And New Jersey is a very small state. It's the third smallest state, and it is the most populous. So, or excuse me, no, the most, sorry, no, it's not the most densely populated. So you have the most people squished in per square mile, but you still do have rural areas and farms and forests and it's beautiful. So it's, it's humid. It was in maybe the sixties today, which is very strange because we're, we're recording uh, last day of November, 2020. And then there was a tornado watch and now there's lightning and thunder. And it's a, a an eclipse. There's an eclipse tonight. A f I think it's a full moon eclipse in Gemini, if you're into astrology. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of actual things and then like um, magic things, I guess, that are happening right now. Yeah, a whole lot of stuff that just isn't normal, so to speak. Which is my whole thing. Yeah, it's a it's a lunar eclipse in Gemini. I don't know if it's a full moon. Yeah, it's not a full moon. I don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, whatever. Um, yeah, so, well, this isn't normal. And since you mentioned it, I'm kind of curious, like, not only what made you kind of start the podcast, but, like, even before the podcast, you served a lot as, like, a public speaker on advocacy for mental health. So I'm kind of curious as far as just what makes you want to push towards more mental health awareness in your life and career. I have been fortunate in my life to have access to excellent mental health care since I was about 14 years old. And I know that I can't wave a magic wand and make that possible for everybody. I can vote for candidates who want to make that possible for everybody. I can donate money to organizations that increase access to mental health care. I'm thinking specifically of Loveland Foundation and to National Alliance on Mental Illness, both of which are good organizations you should check out if you're listening and curious. Um, so, but what I can do is share my experience, my story, um, and encourage people to seek help. And occasionally to provide information on, on resources. Um, that may assist them in seeking that help. So that's what I can do. And it's something I talk about publicly. It's something I talk about privately. Um, I'm, I'm not drawn to becoming a therapist, but this is a way in which I can be of service. I'm a writer. I'm an author. Um, occasionally I'm an actress. I do copywriting as well. I write essays. I write magazine articles. 
uh, you, once in a while still do comedy. So, uh, you know, my career is not to be in the clinical setting as a therapist. My career is also not to be a, a psych researcher, which is fascinating. I find it all very fascinating, but that's, that's not the path that I've chosen. However, I can be of service in this way without any pretense to medical expertise, without pretending that I've got all the answers or most of the answers. I have some answers for me and sometimes those answers change. So um, I guess my goal is that my, through my work, people feel less alone. And through engaging with the work, they feel less alone. And then it leads them to other work, not mine, other work um, by people who, to whom I give a lot of credit for you know, my own life. Um, John Kabat-Zinn would be one of them, a wonderful, wonderful writer um, and, uh, and meditation teacher. Sharon Salzberg is a great meditation teacher as well. There are a lot out there, but um, the way that I'm of service and the way that I make meaning of the stuff that I've experienced, things that, I, I, that have embarrassed me that I feel bad about, you know, some things I feel shame or guilt about, other things I feel angry about, whatever it may be, like one part of me processing that stuff um, is to figure out ways in which I can be of service to others who might be dealing with the same stuff. So it becomes, it's a healing loop. I sometimes call it selfish altruism. That's what I say that the mission of my podcast, well, this isn't normal, is, is selfish altruism. I help other people, um, but it really like also helps me, which is fun. I really like the sound of that, both healing circle and selfish altruism. I like the sound of that. And I also think what you do is just really commendable, like everything as far as like, not even just a podcast, but acting and comedy and writing. I feel like all of that stuff creates, like you said, a loop that inspires people to do great things. And I guess I kind of relate to that in a way, not to say I inspire people. I, I'm not oh, going to- Oh, I'm sure my- you do. I'm sure you do. Absolutely. <laughs> That's absolutely part of of- your podcast not that you are cheesy about it like I think that's why it's inspiring because it's not super cheesy just you know recycling the same platitudes like yeah sometimes we say things that are cliche but we probably choose them because they've proven real for us and that's why they're cliche because they've proven real for a lot of people like put your own oxygen mask on first right I mean you must feel good when you get feedback that the podcast people are listening to the podcast and enjoying it It does feel really good like it feels very I'm still kind of like overwhelmed that people actually listen to this, like what's going to be like 18 episodes deep. Like this is still a fairly new thing, but all the feedback I've gotten has been really positive, really overwhelming. It's shocking really. So I'm glad people can, Inspire is still just a strong word just because I, I just can't bring, maybe it's just my own personality. I can't bring myself to like pat myself on the back like that. Not to say you're patting yourself on the back or, Anything like that, but no, just... I understand. Maybe you can say, Oh, maybe it helps to say. I mean, for me, I say, Um, it makes me feel good that people respond to the work, or they they I feel happy that I can share some stuff and people feel a connection to it because that's not saying, like, Oh, I'm so inspiring, which is gross, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> but that people feel a connection, that people feel less alone that people, that something resonates with them. That's very special, especially now when so many of us can't be with groups of people. We can't, we can't go to, we can't go to music festivals. We can't go to a concert. We can't go to um, a faith gathering. We can't go to, for understandable reasons, because we might, because people are dying because of doing those things. Um, We can't do those things. We shouldn't do those things. It's very dangerous. So this is a way to connect. That, that This is one of the good things about the internet, I think. Yeah, me too. It's like you said, it's like a loop of healing, hoop, bleh, loop of connecting mm-hmm. really. And I think that aspect of it is really cool. And like I was saying, like, I think through all your different avenues, you kind of inspire people through what you do. And it kind of calls me back to an episode I did with another writer, Charlotte T. Merton. And she was talking about how if you're in the middle of the pandemic and you don't really know how to be of service when there's so much going on, you feel like you need to spread your wings and help in some way, but you're not really sure. And she really highlighted how just the small stuff counts, like be it like donating clothes, donating food, or 
just help giving people a lift or just helping people when these times look helpless like the small stuff really counts and like even this podcast it's very small but somehow it's got enough reach where it seems to be helping some people your podcast has a lot of reach seems to be helping people and again you're writing your comedy like that all seems to be helping people and I think that type of healing loop is really cool and like you said the benefits of the internet yeah it's taking this thing this communications tool that humans have created that has been used for a lot of ill and also for a lot of good and using it for good in our small way like maybe we'll never make tons of money off this or any money but but um but we can we can be of service through it and if it allows us to communicate with people who otherwise we wouldn't run into in the day-to-day that can be really special as well absolutely i agree and just to backtrack a little bit like i know you mentioned your sobriety a couple minutes ago uh you've been sober for two years now right Mm -hmm. yeah i quit drinking um like two and a half years ago and quit weed uh and those were the only substances i i used um two years ago Mm -hmm. okay so i'm kind of curious just like how do you or at least do you have any advice for people who struggle to make a conscious effort to remove things be it person place things alcohol anything of that nature how do you remove things from your life that no longer serve you well if you feel that you might be addicted to something and you're concerned about it, there are free groups that you can access online. Some are 12 steps, some are not. Um, but there are there's a lot of free help out there dealing with um, any number of things, gambling, sex, relationships, weed, um, other forms of narcotics, like whatever it is that's your thing. And to be clear, I'm not painting all of these things with a bad brush. I don't think alcohol is inherently evil. I don't think smoking weed. I don't think doing cocaine. I don't think, um, you know, having casual sex, any of that stuff is inherently bad. It can be recreational and fun. Some of it's illegal, you know, be careful. But um, uh, so it's not that it's just, I, you know, I can't drink alcohol. It does things to me that I don't like. And I do things while I am drinking that I don't like. So I, you know, ruined it for my life with the help of uh, an addiction counselor and a sobriety group. There are various ones out there. There are people who will try to take your money. (laughs) And, um, you know, if you need to go into rehab, you need to go into rehab. That has helped a lot of people save their lives. But there are also lots of different options for you um, in terms of online groups and they're all online right now. So I never prescribe, I never evangelize, I never say this is the way or this is not the way. I'm just honest about the fact that I'm a sober person. It has helped me, but if you're, it's sort of like, if you're not diabetic, I wouldn't be like, definitely take insulin. (laughs) It's not an exact comparison. It's not exactly appropriate, but like, if you're just interested in cutting back, on whatever the thing is. There's also great books about that. There are really good books and online courses that you might actually pay for um, and some free some free resources out there. Uh, you know, everybody kind of finds their own way, but I do think that you can, you can use a person as a drug for sure. You can get, just decide that they are the sun, moon and stars uh, and, and my theory, which I didn't invent, I've heard it from different shrinks. It may or may not be true, but my theory is that uh, those people who who stand out as especially just sticky, like you're stuck to them, like to their web, they're not actually trying to make you stuck to their web, probably, unless they're truly malevolent. Um, but you're if you just keep going back to it, like this person does not have you trapped in their home, God forbid, you just keep going back for more. Uh, they probably are hitting something that that was there for you very early on. It's you're repeating something, something that's buried inside you from when you were very small. And it's not necessarily a healthy thing. If, if, if you feel like somebody, you just can't quit them, that's not healthy. That's not healthy. If you feel like, wow, I really love this person. I don't want to live without this person. I want to live with this person. We make each other's lives better. I know I could survive without them. I just don't want to. We make each other really happy. 
not, we make each other happy. I mean, sure. Sometimes they hit me. No, 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 not okay. Or yeah, sure. They steal from me. No, 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 not okay. Or, oh yeah, they cheat on me, even though we don't have a consensually non-monogamous relationship. No, 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 not okay. I'm saying you help each other heal. You're healthy. You're happy together. You enjoy each other. Yes. You go through tough times, but you work through it without violence, without thievery. (laughs) That's different. That's good. Um, but if there's somebody who all your friends and your family are like, you need to get away from that person. They are not good to you. Not because you're dealing with your family being upset. You're dating somebody of a different race, different religion, different country of origin. Not, I'm not saying objections based in like, uh, racism, xenophobia, whatever the hell it may be. I'm saying like, somebody, they literally are like, this person's dangerous for you. You are different around them. You don't seem happy. You know, if if people in your life are telling you that, listen um, and listen, because if some of them have really are wise people, loving people, they're they're probably not taking the risk of saying that just for anything, because it's hard to say, hey, you know, Sarah, I just, you don't seem like yourself with him. What's going on there? Um, Do you feel comfortable there? Like, you, everybody finds their own way, but I do think that when people around us who bring us joy, who we enjoy, who we love, indicate to us that somebody seems to be affecting us negatively, perhaps in ways we can't see, like that's worth listening to. I just went all over the place with that response, by the way. I don't even know where we started. Don't remember. No, I think you mentioned some really good things. And like you talked about just, I think you made a really important distinction, like when you need to cut something out of your life or cut someone out of your life, it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that that thing is inherently evil. Like, Mm -hmm. like you said, alcohol can be good. Casual sex can be good. If it's creating a negative response in your body, then that's when you try to remove from your life. And same with a person, the person can be amazing. You may have amazing times with them. If they do inherently things that hurt you emotionally or physically, then that's when you cut them out of your life. And when you see that distinction, then 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 it's time to put in the work to try to remove them or it from your life. And I'm I think you did a really great job of breaking that down. Thank you. And I, I think, for example, I had a friend who was engaged to somebody who turned out to be a sex addict, uh, not somebody who was cheating on them. I don't mean that they were, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is somebody who um, had to have sex with multiple people multiple times a day, whether they had to pay for it, um, just get it on the side, whatever it was. And and thus it was putting my friend's life in danger, right? Because this person was surely not using condoms with all these individuals. Um, so her health, her health was put in danger. And also their agreement in their relationship was that they were monogamous and he was repeatedly violating the agreement. You know, they went to counseling, tried to make things better, but he, his addiction, he was addicted to the thrill or whatever of, of all the things that, that he was doing. He was a good person in so many ways, funny, loving, caring, very helpful, like absolutely generous. But this thing that was happening was putting her emotional life and her physical life in danger. So she had to end that relationship, which was heartbreaking. But she never said he's a bad person. He's an evil person. So and and it was very hard for her then to not go back to him because there was a deep bond there. But he was not good for her. And he might be able to find somebody, I don't know, where that that lifestyle like worked for them, um, where they perhaps weren't interested, where, you know, who knows? But um, I do think in this case, though, that this person's whole thing was violating boundaries. So even if he found somebody who wanted to be ethically non-monogamous, well, that requires you to be ethical. And you could set up whatever the rules were, uh, sleep with anybody you want to, you don't have to tell me their name, just don't do it in the house. This is a guy who would bring them over the house. (laughs) Like, you know, so whatever his deal is, whatever his deal is. But for my friend, it was not deciding he was evil. It was going, this person is doing this thing and it hurts me. And I don't think they can stop whether they can't stop or they won't stop. They're not stopping. So that means I have to remove myself from the situation. And, and so she did, you know, and hopefully that person gets, gets the help they need, or maybe that's just who they are. 
you know, they weren't doing other than cheating on somebody who did not say it was okay. They weren't doing anything non-consensual. They were not assaulting these people. Maybe that's just how this person lives his life. Who knows? But it wasn't good for my friend. So she had to get out of there. And sometimes it's a lot less dramatic than that. Sometimes it's just, you know, you two no longer, the spark isn't there and it's not coming back and you, you want the spark. One of you wants the spark, both of you want the spark. It's not there. So it's time for that relationship to conclude. Or you just realize, I mean, I have another friend who, you know, he wanted kids. His girlfriend didn't. Um, he thought he could change her mind. She thought she could change his mind. They went out for five years. Nobody changed anybody's mind. <laughs> so they had to part ways. And that was really heartbreaking for both of them. Uh, and I've been in situations, you know, not like either one of those things, but of my own where I just finally realized, okay, this isn't going to change this. So, and it doesn't mean the other person's a bad person. Sometimes it's easy to paint them as a bad person <laughs> in your mind or to your friends. But the reality is a lot of the times they're not, they're not demonic. They're not evil. Uh, they're just not for you anymore. I know I veered out of the addiction ver thing, but I guess the, the addiction thing would be like, like I said, you know, some people can go gambling and it's fun. I can go gamble. I find it very boring. I do the slot machines and I'm like, this is boring. I'm not doing this again. And then I just, in Vegas, I go to the buffet and I go to watch a show. Other people will stay at the slot machine as long as they can and they will lose all their money or they will stay at the poker table. And, you know, for me, gambling is not a bad thing. It's just, I'm not that into it. The, with like sugar, I like sugar. It's good but I don't freak out on it until I throw up, you know, for other people, it's different. Yeah. I think that's really, that's really important to mention too. Cause a lot of times I've learned this myself fairly recently, a relationship not working doesn't necessarily mean that you or the other person is evil. It just means, or even toxic. It just means that you two are, just not clicking for whatever reason anymore like that person no longer serves you anymore and you no longer serve them and that's not necessarily a bad thing sometimes it's not necessarily a instance of you doing something wrong or them doing something wrong sometimes it's just people grow people change as they grow and sometimes people change in a way where the chemistry is off now and that's when you have to veer off from that person which again is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes veering off just means taking the knowledge that you've learned from this relationship and carrying it into new relationships and building stronger relationships with your pre-existing relationships. Sometimes it means taking that knowledge and finding new opportunities for yourself, finding new friendships and stuff like that. So you, I don't think that in situations like that, at least, you shouldn't think of it as something that's lost or a painful bad thing that this relationship is over you you still got your fond memories so if nothing else just just use the energy you have to kind of to kind of move on in the best way you can does that sound how does that sound yeah that makes sense you still just because something ends and just because something is painful in its conclusion does not mean that it had no merit you probably learned from it and not just the bad stuff you probably also learned some things that you actually like which is really cool i have to go by the way so we gotta i gotta wrap it up i was gonna say that might be a really good place to end it too and i thank you for coming on just one more thing and then we can wrap up uh, I, I like to end every episode by with the segment I like to call giving people their flowers, where if we, if I never speak to my guests again, I tell them how much I appreciate them. And I appreciate you just for all of the work you've done with, well, this is a normal, like that podcast and especially the thick of quarantine that really got me through some tough days. It helped me work through some stuff internally. And it also most importantly helped me make sense of the not so normal stuff going on around me. And I think that you've also, done that for other people like you like I said earlier like you do so many different avenues comedy writing all of that and you excel at all of them in a way that I seriously think that you've inspired people in different ways as far as how you analyze things and situations and I think that you have through your podcast especially you've kind of given people hope and hope is a hard thing to find these days especially and I thank you for starting the podcast thank you for just being you and thank you for coming on this podcast 
That is so meaningful to me. Thank you. Uh, you know, we hear, I think so often give people your flower, their flowers while they're still here, especially after someone great passes on. And, and um, a lot of times the people who were great, great in the sense of they affected so many people's lives, like Prince, you know, Prince got his flowers. <laughs> Prince got a lot of flowers. Um, but where it becomes so, you know, intimately applicable is when we think about other people who were never famous, uh, who were never super well known, who pass on. And I think we see that, I've been seeing that a lot this year. When I see people sharing about those they've lost who died from COVID. Um, and also people who have died by suicide, uh, especially this year in the midst of a lot of isolation. And that is so meaningful to me. Thank you for saying those things. And, and I really, I really appreciate and, and honor you for doing the work and for letting yourself be vulnerable by giving back those kind of kind words to somebody. And I mean, I'm very excited for this to come out. And I'll also, of course, like promote you know, within my newsletter that goes out soon, I want to share that article about, about Eminem and Lord Byron. That's so cool. And also to share this podcast so that, cause my, my newsletter is all about, you know, it's like photos, um, a little bit of writing, uh, updates, and also a list of recommendations of things that might make you feel better this week. So this, this podcast, um, your podcast in general will definitely be in there this week. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate both the kind words and you sharing them. Um...